Well, aloha. Uh, welcome to uh, Wednesday morning, Aloha Wednesday Chapel. Uh, these, just for every, just so everyone knows, uh, they, these are actually referred to as Aloha shirts or Aloha attire. Uh, lots of people might call them Hawaiian shirts or tropical shirts. Um, that's usually tourists say things like that in Hawaii. So it's, if you want to sound like the locals, we, we call it Aloha attire. And that word Aloha, uh, it really does mean, maybe you learned this from Lilo and Stitch, it, it really does mean hello or goodbye. It's the greeting and it's the, uh, the, the, the phrase that you, you would say for goodbye. It also does mean I love you uh, for a lot of people. It's the word for love in, in Hawaiian. Um, uh, and when, when you drive uh, in, in the islands, uh, people really do, for the most part, drive with aloha. Uh, there is a lot of just letting people go. Hardly anybody gets mad at each other out there. Um, so when you hear somebody like honking like for a long time, because uh, because you cut them off, you just know they're not from around there. So, um, just I it it it's, um, it, it brings in a lot of the the Asian uh, culture, and um, I, I do uh, really enjoy the the laid back style on the roads there. Uh, we really do love pineapples, uh, the the dole cannery. Uh, pineapple plantation. They, they're one of the biggest producers of pineapple in the world, and, and it's really good. Uh, I don't know if it's... it's. It, I'm sure there's other uh, great pineapple producers in the world, uh, but the, the Dole pineapples are, are really good if you ever get a chance. And we actually really do love Spam out there, too. <laughs> Fried Spam. Um... I don't know. I, I think some people eat it straight out of the can, and that's disgusting to me, too. So we love our Spam, but not that much. Um, so we, we love Spam and pineapple, um, but, but neither of those should go on pizza. Uh, I did hear that Hawaiian pizza was, was invented in Canada, somewhere in Canada, I guess. Um, and I, I also am aware that that Hawaiian pizza, you know, the ham and pineapple on pizza. Uh, I think that's offensive to both Italians and Hawaiians. Like, it's, it's neither Hawaiian nor pizza. So, anyway, just be careful about those kinds of things when you come out there. I'm going to read to you Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 through 20, and then I'll pray. Matthew chapter 16. Verses 13 through 20. Uh, I also forgot to mention with the Aloha attire, th this is just something you'll, you'll have to just have a paradigm shift with. Uh, most locals with this Aloha attire, it's not casual attire for us. This is actually the, the business suits out there. Uh, if you go to downtown Honolulu, all, all the business people are, are wearing these uh, ladies with Aloha print dresses, men with this kind of attire. Uh, many weddings, this is how you dress at, at the weddings. And so, uh, again, the, the tourist thinks it's casual, but uh, this is actually, this is my Sunday attire here. Matthew chapter 16, verse 13. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not Reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, 
And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. Let me pray. Lord God, we thank you for this great confession from Peter that we all hold to. I pray that you will help me now in my weakness to expound this great confession and the great blessing of our Lord Jesus Messiah. So please bless this time by your spirit. Reveal more of yourself to us by your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. This might sound really strange to you, but every Christian church or every Christian group that regularly recites the historic creeds. So if you're not familiar with the, histor the historic creeds, things like the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. Any, any church that's regularly reciting those is actually living out the truth of this passage in one way. It's not the only way to live out this passage, but you can be sure reciting the creeds regularly is a faithful application of this passage. I hope to help you see that. My main exhortation to you, in order to help the world see the light of Christ, we must confess Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God. We must confess him, and it's always a public thing. Confess him as Jesus, the Messiah, and the Son of God. If you deny those things, you go to hell. There's more to the Christian life than just believing the right doctrines, but there is not less. And so if we want others to go to heaven, we must confess and proclaim Jesus accurately. Let me just share two implications of this passage to help us in that. Number one, precise theology is vital. Precise theology is vital in the Christian life. Verse 13 now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do the people say that the Son of Man is? Caesarea Philippi was built by one of the Herods, Herod, Herod Philip, and he named the city after the Roman emperor Caesar Augustus, hence the name Caesarea Philippi. That's the significance of of this place. Jesus asks the disciples a very important question about his identity in a city that was devoted to the Roman emperor. And he asks, who do people say the Son of Man is? Referring to himself. Son of Man is a title Jesus would use for himself from the book of Daniel, where God promised one like a Son of Man who receives dominion and glory, and a kingdom, and all peoples are going to worship this powerful, glorious figure. There's a lot of doctrine involved in just in the phrase son of man. So he asks, who do people say the son of man is? In verse 14, and they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets of the Old Testament. It was the current Herod at the time who wondered if Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. He had been beheaded by this point. Others suspected Jesus was the promised Elijah an Elijah-type prophet from the book of Malachi. Others wondered if he was Jeremiah or one of the Old Testament prophets who confronted Israel on many occasions. Jesus fits the profile of some great prophet. You notice they're all dead guys that people were guessing. 
John the Baptist had already been beheaded. All the others are Old Testament prophets. And yet people were wondering. Jesus' ministry was so unique. They were wondering if he was some old guy come back from the dead. People are willing to believe all kinds of things before they believe Jesus is the Son of God. Also, notice people's guesses are only good guys. It's not like they're wondering, I wonder if this is like Pharaoh or Nebuchadnezzar come back from the dead. No, they, they just mentioned he must be, he's like one of the greatest preachers in the history of the world. And yet all of their guesses, even if they're sort of on the right track, they're extremely offensive guesses to God. Because all they're guessing is that he is a mere man, a mere creature. I was really saddened by Tim Keller's passing a couple of months ago, a great preacher in Manhattan for many years. Uh, if you thought I was Tim Keller reincarnated, I'd be pretty pretty flattered by that. But if you wonder if Jesus is just a great prophet, that's blasphemy. He's no mere created being. We, we must strive for precise. They were on the right track, but it's still blasphemy. We must strive for precise, accurate, doctrinal beliefs about Jesus. He said to them, verse 15, but who do you say that I am? And remember, he's been investing heavily, training his disciples. Even when there's lots of large crowds, he makes sure he's been teaching his disciples intentionally. So who do you say that I am? He's, he's really, it's a, he, he flips the, the word you into the plural here. He's really asking all the disciples. He's really asking all of you today. Who do you say that the Son of Man is? What matters for your soul? It doesn't matter what people out there are saying. It doesn't matter what you were taught growing up. What matters for your soul today? Who do you say that I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. This is a great confession of faith. He calls Jesus the Christ. It's a title. Just so everyone's on the same page. Christ is not Jesus' last name. The word Christ is the Greek translation of the word Messiah. So depending which translation you're memorizing, it's either you are the Christ or you are the Messiah. They mean the same word. The word Messiah from the Old Testament, means the anointed one. He's the one God specially set apart. There were many little messiahs. That all the prophets, priests, and kings were little messiahs throughout Old Testament history. But Jesus is the messiah. From Genesis 3, Genesis 49, 2 Samuel 7, Psalm 2, Isaiah 53, Daniel 7, and many other passages, there is this promised, anointed man of God who also seems divine all throughout the Old Testament that all of Israel's waiting to arrive to save them. And Peter knows these promises, so like many of his fellow Jews, he was awaiting a Messiah, and he believes Jesus is the Messiah. This is a great confession of faith. He also believes Jesus is the son of the living God. The word living is a great way to distinguish our God from all other false dead gods. And son of God. It's a term that means much more than most Christians often think about. You don't just call anyone the son of God. The term son of God in the truest sense necessarily means he is God the son. There's God the father and the, the Son of God has to also be God the Son in the same way that 
the Holy Spirit of God has to be, if he's truly holy, has to be God, the Holy Spirit. Uh, each has to be God while each being his own person. Son of God necessarily means God the Son. You know, Latter-day Saints and other cults might call Jesus the Son of God, but they don't believe he is God, and that's just because they're not thinking deeply enough about what they're saying when they call Jesus the Son of God. They haven't thought about what it means for God to have an only begotten one come from him. Even our kids can understand that if someone is the son of God, he is like God the Father. Human children are of the same nature as their human parents. The son of God has the same nature as his father. The big difference, though, is that if, if you share the same nature as God, you are God. Built into that title, the Son of God is the doctrine of the Trinity. There are multiple persons who share the same nature, the same essence. This is why the Jews in John 5 wanted to kill Jesus for calling himself God's Son. For in calling himself God's Son, they knew he was making himself equal with God. That's why the, the Muslims actually insightfully reject Jesus as the Son of God. Because they understand the implications of calling him the Son. Peter, regardless of how deeply he grasps this at the time, he made a good, accurate confession of faith. You are the Messiah, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That's why verse 17, Jesus answered him, blessed are you. You know, he doesn't always bless Peter for the things that come out of Peter's mouth. But at this moment, blessed are you, Simon, Bar Jonah, or son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. There's no way he could have figured this out on his own. Or no way any mere creature could have known this or revealed it to Peter. But my Father in heaven is the one who revealed this. The only way anyone can have accurate knowledge of Jesus is if God graciously reveals it to you. This is why it's a very Trinitarian passage all the way around because the God consistently in the Bible reveals truth to his people by the Holy Spirit. So Peter received this true knowledge of Christ from the Father by the Spirit. We need accurate knowledge of Jesus to be saved and only God gives this knowledge. So blessed are you, brothers and sisters, if and only if you see Jesus as Messiah, the anointed one, and the son of the living God. You're, you're as blessed as you possibly can be if you believe Jesus is the Messiah and the son of God. As John Calvin has said about this passage Peter's confession, I quote, is, is short, but it embraces all that is contained in our salvation. For the designation Christ includes both an everlasting kingdom and an everlasting priesthood, if you understand all the Old Testament promises about the Messiah, to reconcile us to God through his sacrifice and concerning the title Son of God, he was so fully persuaded of the dignity of Christ that he believed him to come from God, not like other men, but by the inhabitation of the true and living Godhead in his flesh, end quote. He could see all, Peter could see all of God in Jesus. So he confessed Jesus basically, as the God-man here. This is why I think this confession of faith by Peter is simply the historic Christian faith that has been passed down to us through the ages, as summarized in documents like the Apostles and Nicene Creeds, 
the Athanasian Creed and others. It's the Christian faith in seed form here. Because if you think deeply enough about what it means that Jesus is Messiah and the Son of God, you end up thinking about all the major tenets of the Christian faith, the historic Christian faith. Brothers and sisters, blessed are you if you believe what Peter believes. The other implication of this passage to, to help us hold fast to the right confession Number two, Jesus gives great authority to those confessing him rightly. He gives amazing authority, and it's given to us. We don't have it apart from him, but he gives it to us, this great authority to those confessing him rightly. The call here is to make sure we are connected to not just the right doctrines, but also to the right people. All those who have confessed the faith before us. And it starts by believing in one and only one holy, Catholic, or universal and apostolic church. There, there's just one holy, Catholic, apostolic church. Verse 18, and I tell you, you are Peter. And on this rock... I will build my church. Jesus names him Peter here, similar to how God changed Abram's name to Abraham or Jacob's name to Israel. He renames people to give them a unique role in redemptive history. The name Peter simply means rock. And Jesus says, on this rock, I will build my church. Now, the Roman Catholic Church, who I will only refer to for the rest of this sermon as the Roman Church, the Roman Church wrongly takes this to mean that Peter was like the first pope. And every pope since sits in Peter's office. That would be a wrong way to connect ourselves to the historic church. But evangelicals, most of us here, we don't have to overreact to the Roman Church and say Peter's not the rock in this passage. P P Jesus says Peter's a rock. That's just what his name means. And some will say, no, the rock in this passage is the confession of Jesus as the Messiah. But there's nothing special about Peter. And nobody's arguing, and no evangelical would argue that Peter's better than everyone else for saying what he said. But you just, you just read the passage. Historically, historically, Peter is a unique foundational person for the entire New Covenant Church because this was the first time someone was publicly confessing Jesus as the Messiah and Son of God the way Peter is here. This is the clearest confession so far in the Bible. And as I mentioned, everything in our gospel is implied by this little confession of faith. Peter, Peter really did say something marvelous here, and Jesus is simply acknowledging that. And if you keep reading the New Testament, God does build historically upon Peter in unique ways. Peter preaches the gospel to the Jews in Acts 2, and 3,000 Jews come to faith. He was historically instrumental in saving many Jews. Then in Acts 8, he was instrumental in saving many Samaritans. And then in Acts 10, he's instrumental in bringing many Gentiles to faith. Jesus really did build his church upon Peter uniquely. Peter's what I would call an historical rock. That's all that you should see there with Peter. He was truly blessed to be used by God in a similar way that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Mary, the blessed Mary herself, was used historically in unique ways. But here's how we know that Pe that's where Peter's uniqueness ends. In other words, here's how we know the Roman church's view of Peter is wrong. Our response to this passage should not be 
make sure we're under the authority of the Pope then. No, we need to make sure our confession of faith is the same confession of faith that Peter spoke. Here's how we know that Protestants are viewing this passage correctly. Because Peter is not building the church. The the apostles are not building the church. Jesus is the one building the church. He chooses to use fallen, sinful creatures like the apostles to build his church, but he is the builder. The reason we devote ourselves to the apostles' teachings today is because they were preaching Jesus as the Christ and the Son of the living God. But at the end of the day, Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus is the builder, and this thing he builds is called the church. That's why I say, brothers and sisters, we must reclaim the word Catholic from the Roman church. They think their church is the one Jesus is building. But we know the true Catholic, the true universal church is made up of every single person who is confessing Jesus as the Christ and the son of the living God. That's the true Catholic church. It's the only one Jesus is building. Like Peter confessed, like the apostles taught, the, the, the thing that Jesus is building is the people who have the right confession. It's the only way you get into this thing, and it's the only way Jesus is building this thing. And Jesus says this church will never be defeated. The word hell could also be translated Hades or the grave is the equivalent of Sheol from the Old Testament. Hades swallowed up everyone throughout the Old Testament, but one day Jesus would die. And as the Apostles' Creed says, he descended to Hades, which means his human soul experienced death apart from his body that was in the grave or in the tomb. Then on the third day, he rose from the dead. Because Jesus descended to Hades and overcame it, Hades cannot overcome the church. When Jesus says he will build this church, the way he builds it is by dying and rising again. And everyone who then trusts in him is a part of this thing he's building. And then he helps us understand how much authority the church has, just how much authority this church has on earth. Verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus promised to give Peter a set of keys There's all kinds of interpretive difficulties here. The simplest way I know how to explain this is that Jesus gave Peter and the apostles a unique authority. There there are no apostles anymore, at least not in this Peter and the rest of the apostles, these original 12 cents. But at the same time, everyone who devotes themselves to the apostles' teaching carries the apostles' authority. So there is still the apostles' authority today. We call it the Bible. It's the inspired writings. The the historic interpretation of this, the the keys of the kingdom, at, at least in the Reformed tradition, which I'm a part of, is that the keys of the kingdom are held in the teaching authority of the church. That includes the right preaching of the gospel and the right administration of the sacraments or the ordinances, which are baptism and the Lord's Supper. Those are the signs. You have the preached word, and then you have the signs of the preached word, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So in short, if we 
preach the same gospel that the apostles preached, which was and is Jesus is the Christ. He's the son of the living God. And all that he accomplished for us men and for our salvation, if we preach that gospel, we have the authority of the apostles and we are most definitely a part of the church Jesus is building. I cannot stress to you how important it is. I can't stress to you enough how important it is for your churches to have faithful preaching. It's the only way to know for sure you're a part of this thing Jesus is building. The only way to know for sure you're a part of the church Catholic, the true church. Again, I, when you hear me say the word Catholic, I'm saying we, we reclaim it. We don't let them steal it from it. We're reclaiming it. The Roman church is not the Catholic church. So, so then what, what, are, what, what are keys exactly communicating to us? What does it mean to bind and loose? We'll work this out, Lord willing, even more tomorrow because Jesus uses the same phrase in Matthew 18, which I'll, I'll preach tomorrow. But let me explain both phrases just a little bit today. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. What Jesus is giving to us is authority, basically, to open and close the kingdom of heaven. That's what keys are for, locking and unlocking. Isaiah 22 and Revelation 3 both talk about the Messiah as the one who's holding the key of David, the whole, holding the key to the house of David, and that's him having authority to let people into God's kingdom. And here you see the church is given the keys of the kingdom of heaven by Jesus himself. There's nothing more important than the kingdom of heaven, and there's no one with more authority than Jesus himself. For, so, so for Jesus to give the keys of the kingdom of heaven to the church means the church has more spiritual authority than anyone else on earth. We, have, we actually have the authority to tell the world what is right and what is wrong, what God wants and what God doesn't want what is good for humanity and what's not good for humanity. So the, the keys are one illustration of the church's authority. And as I mentioned, it's connected to the right teaching and right administration of baptism and the Lord's Supper. And in case you're not sure how that ends up, how those things end up being the keys of the kingdom, think about how preaching, baptism, and the Lord's Supper function, or at least are supposed to function, if we preach the gospel and someone believes, we baptize them. Again, I'm speaking from a Baptist perspective. I assume most evangelicals have that same perspective. When someone believes, we baptize them. Baptism shows who is holding to the right teaching. And then the Lord's Supper or communion is meant to be a regular examination of those who believe. So if someone doesn't believe, we should not baptize and if someone who's been baptized stops believing, we should no longer serve them the Lord's Supper. That's just a, a quick overview of how the preaching and the sacraments function as the church holding the keys of the kingdom today. As Christ's representatives on earth, we basically open and close the door for the kingdom of heaven under his authority. The local church has no authority apart from Jesus giving it, and apart from devoting ourselves to the apostles' teachings, but if we are preaching the right gospel, there is no higher spiritual authority to look for on earth. Then the other illustration is, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Jesus switches metaphors in the second half of the verse. First it was keys locking and unlocking. Now it's binding or tying and loosing or unloosing or un un loosing or untying. He moves from keys to ropes or cords. Many have taken the binding and loosing as a description of what the keys do, but I, I think that they're, they're two separate 
metaphors that, that just have slightly different aspects to the church's role. Matthew Henry has pointed out how Jewish rabbis actually use this exact binding and loosing language in their teachings to refer to you, uh, you, the things you bind are things you prohibit people from doing, and things you loose are things you allow people to do. There's no reason to think Jesus would use it in a radically different way. Jesus even said in Matthew 5.20, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, literally whoever looses one of the least of these commandments will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, if you allow people to do what God forbids, if you loose what God binds or bind what God looses, you will be least in the kingdom of heaven. That seems to inform Matthew 16. The church must bind what God binds and loose what God looses. We must forbid what God forbids and commend to people what God commends. We have to call evil evil and we have to call good good. And, and never get those mixed up. In so many words, the church's role is to tell the world what they can and cannot do. To tell the world and ourselves. That's why we have to make sure we believe the right things about Jesus. And we have to make sure we devote ourselves to the apostles' teachings, the Bible. Without the Bible, we should not speak authoritatively about right and wrong. But with the Bible, we cannot but speak with authority. Now, we know the church is not perfect. We will get things wrong here and there. But Jesus is teaching us what our role here is on earth. So we need to keep growing into this role by his grace, by prayer, by dependence on the spirit. We have to be able to tell each other and the world, this is what marriage is. This is not marriage. This is what a man is. This is what a woman is. We, we have to, we cannot but speak about these things with the Bible in hand. And when they respond, and they will, who are you to judge me? What we should say is not, don't, don't apologize for Jesus. Don't say things like, well, you know, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have said it like that myself. You know, it's, just, it's in there, it's in that book there. Don't, don't apologize for God. We have to say, Jesus has given us the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And we want to bind on earth what will have been bound in heaven. We want to loose on earth what has been loosed in heaven Jesus is the Christ and the Son of the living God. So repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, we know the church is not perfect. We will get things wrong at different times, and that's when we can repent before a watching world. But if people have questions about their soul, if people have questions about morality, what is right and what is wrong? Is this pleasing to God or not? If people have spiritual questions, where else are they going to go? Except to the people who have the authority of Christ behind them. Where else would you turn to, brothers and sisters? Are you struggling to figure out what you should do in certain parts of your life? Are you trying to understand God's will for your life better? The church is the one Jesus gave authority to, not Christian counselors outside the church or usually not some YouTube preacher who doesn't know you at all. No one will give you better guidance than the Christian church confessing Jesus as the Messiah and the Son of God. And then lastly, verse 20, in closing, then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he was the Christ. 
This is always strange for us to read in, from our perspective because everything in us says we're supposed to tell everyone that he is the Christ, and that is true today. And so what has to be happening at this moment, and anytime Jesus says things like this in the gospel narratives, he knows what needs to happen first is the resurrection. Before he rises from the dead, the news that he is the Messiah just will not make sense to most people, and it just causes all kinds of chaos. They want him to fill this, these political roles that he's not meant to fulfill. People get really confused before the resurrection. But after the resurrection, and now fast forward 2,000 years, Jesus has risen from the dead, so we can confidently go out and tell people that he is the Christ. And keep asking yourselves, brothers and sisters, who do I say the Son of Man is? I believe he's the Messiah. Keep reminding yourself, I believe he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. That means I am blessed. And hell cannot touch me. Let's pray. Our Lord, please help all of us to hold fast to the confession of our hope and to wield this great authority with great humility. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.